Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. And today I'll be talking about the espresso sequencer. So this is work done by a lot of researchers and engineers, many of who are over here, and I'm just representing them. So in today's talk, uh, I'm going to focus on three key things. So first, I'm going to talk about what a shared decentralized sequencer is and how this is different from a state machine replication system. And then I will talk about espresso sequencer. And in particular, I'll, I'll, I'll speak about hotshot consensus and tiramisu data availability. So let me start off with something that we already know. So state machine replication. Uh, so in state machine replication, we have a group of server nodes and they provide you with the same interface as that of a single non-faulty server. And this they do so even if some of these servers are Byzantine faulty. For example, the server to the bottom right is Byzantine faulty. So your single server is actually receiving transactions and, and executing these transactions based off of a state machine. And the server nodes are trying to replicate exactly that. We have clients submitting transactions, which are so no agreed upon as blocks. Associated. And you, you keep doing this and, and you form a blockchain and you execute these transactions. There are two key properties uh, that need to hold in this process. One is safety, which says that any two non-faulty nodes do not learn a different sequence of value. And the second is liveness, which says that a value proposed by a client will be eventually executed by every non-faulty server node. So if I splice this differently and think about you know, what a server node needs to do in this process, there are three key requirements. The first one is data broadcast, where you're ensuring that transaction data is broadcast to every non faulty node. Second is consensus, which is about agreeing on the order of these transactions. And finally, there is execution where you're executing transactions on, on uh, based off of what has been agreed upon when you update the state machine. So we want to understand how these requirements for state machine replication compare to that of, of a sequencer. But before I do that, you know, let me give you a very quick introduction to what a sequencer is. So in today's uh, <laughs> system, uh, a sequencer sits in, in, in the L2 layer and, and typically it is together uh, with a rollup. Over here, I'm uh, separating out, separating this out for conceptual clarity. So you have clients submitting transactions to this rollup, which is sent to the sequencer. The sequencer then orders these transactions and sends them back uh, to the rollup. And the rollup is the one that is responsible for actually executing these transactions. And based off of this, after this execution, some state update is sent to layer one. And, and this may be accompanied with some things. So in, in, in the way it is today, there are two key concerns with the sequencer. First, you have a sequencer for each rollup. And what that means is that, you know, if you have multiple different uh, rollups, each with a different sequencer, interoperability across these rollups is harder. So because the only place where these transactions meet is layer one. And second, the sequencer is centralized. And what that means is that it, it forms a single point of failure. So it can censor transactions, it can perhaps, you know, monopolize uh, because it has, because it is a centralized entity. So in this talk, I'm going to focus on the second part in how we, we can decentralize the sequencer and essentially use a set of nodes to sequence uh, rollup transactions. So the two key advantages over here are, you know, you can provide finality on the ordering of transactions for a given rollup and, and you can do so much faster so far as, you know, the end client trusts this decentralized entity. So if Ethereum does this of, of the order of 12 to 18 minutes, we can do this, you know, much faster, you know, in, in a few seconds or so. And second, because you have decentralization, you can get censorship resistance and, you know, you can prevent monopolization. So with this in mind, let's try to look at, you know, what the requirements for a sequencer are. So as we mentioned a couple of slides ago, you know, execution is done by the rollup itself. So you don't need execution over here. And second, if you're not executing as a data node, you actually don't need to have access to all of the data. All you need is to have enough information so that any external client who is attempting to 
collect all of this information can actually get it. So even if every party over here, every node over here has access to some data share, that actually suffices. And of course, uh, we are we require these nodes to order these transactions. So in that sense, the requirements of a sequencer are you know lesser than that of a state machine replication. And the two key things that you need are you know consensus and data availability. And that is exactly what I'm going to focus on uh, for the rest of my talk. So with the SRSO sequencer, there are these two key components and we've designed them in, in a modular way where we are, we are separating these concerns. So this is based off of, you know, a lot of prior work such as, uh, such as PRISM, such as Narval, which says, you know, separating these two tasks uh, it can help and, and it also helps with modularity. And that is why, you know, I, I will focus on one of these components at a time. So let me start off with Hotshot. Uh, as we've already seen, you know, this it, we are creating a decentralized layer to order roll-up transactions. And with this, you would get finality on the order, censorship resistance, and, and so prevent monopolization. Let us try to see, uh, you know, if you want to have all of these properties, what are some of the security and efficiency requirements in such a system? And this is what we aim for uh, with, with Hotshot in the Espresso Sequencer. The first requirement that we aim for is Ethereum level security. So if you can get the same security guarantees as that of Ethereum, then your finality or pre-confirmation that you obtain would be the same as, you know, uh, Ethereum's finality. And, uh, and, and, and you know, you, you wouldn't have to wait for 12 to 18 minutes. Otherwise, you know, you're, you're relying on having two levels of security and so far as you know, nodes trust this layer, that's good. But if not having the same security as Ethereum is, is helpful. And for that reason, the way we achieve this is by relying on the same set of nodes as, as Ethereum itself. And so we plan to use something like Eigenlayer uh, to actually achieve this. And so I, as a requirement, we also need accountability in the underlying protocol so that when nodes perform slashable offenses, uh, they can be slashed. So this works with slashable offenses, but what about the ones that are not slashable? For example, a liveness violation, or, uh, or if you're censoring transactions. So these violations can happen and they are not easily detectable. You know, you may argue that liveness violation may not be in the interest of, uh, of an adversary causing it, but censoring transactions may be. And you can easily cause these violations by, you know, an adversary bribing nodes to, to, do, to, to do a particular task such as censoring. And this can be done through external means, you know. So prior work has shown that you can just set up a website and bribe these parties to perform certain actions for, uh, for a bribe. So bribery resistance is another requirement uh, in terms of security. So I'll note that this, is, this requirement is not the same as adaptive security. In some sense, it is stronger because an adversary over here does not need to know who to target uh, in the process. However, at the same time, you know, if, if I just say bribery resistance, that is hard to achieve because bribery is, is a very strong adversary. You know, if I had $1 trillion, I could just bribe every Ethereum node to not participate uh, in, in, in Ethereum, right? So if you have an unlimited budget, that is going to be hard. So we consider relaxation over here where, where we are going to bound the adversarial budget to something that's linear in, in the number of uh, nodes. And what this means is, you know, in particular, they're ruling out very specific solutions such as committee-based solutions where committees are used for the security of the system. So if you're electing a small committee and the entire security depends on it, this entire committee is bribable. So in terms of security, we want Ethereum level security and we want bribery resistance. Let's look at you know, some of our efficiency considerations. So the first thing that we want to do in terms of our properties is you know, we want to complement Ethereum's performance. So Ethereum gives you some good things, for example, uh, dynamic availability, right? But in terms of finality, again, things are slow. So what we plan to do is we, we plan to have a fast finality at the same time, good throughput. And second, you know, we said in our security requirements, we are planning to use uh, Ethereum's nodes. So 
if that is the case, then we need to have a protocol be able to scale to these Ethereum nodes. And this boils down to two requirements again. One is the number of nodes. You know, we don't want to run this on hundreds of nodes, but perhaps thousands or tens of thousands of nodes. That's one. And second, we want the resources consumed by a node to be modest. So we don't want any of these nodes to be running and mpy.8x large machines on AWS, but instead something much smaller as an example, perhaps, you know, a machine with four plus core, 16 GB plus RAM and 25 megabytes per second bandwidth. So these are the two uh, efficiency considerations that, that, that we make. So given this, let's try to uh, get a sense for, you know, what properties a hotshot consensus has and uh, how we achieve uh, these properties how we achieve these goals. So our consensus protocol, uh, Hotshot, is based on Hot Stuff 2. Um, so I, I do not have the time to go into the details of Hot Stuff 2, but at a very high level, it's a partially synchronous protocol tolerating one-third Byzantine faults. So the protocol proceeds in different views. So as, as what you can see in the grayed out portion over here, that is representing a communication in a view where there is a leader to all communication and all to leader communication. And optimistically, we commit in two views. So optimistically over here means that, you know, when the network is good and when the leader is honest, then we would commit in two views. So when you're running the protocol, right? So sometimes some messages may get delayed. For example, over here, uh, the message to party two or node two uh, is delayed, right? And sometimes things may be fast. So one property that Hot Stuff 2 has and Hot Shot inherits is optimistic responsiveness, which says that whenever things are fast, you can move at the speed of the network. <laughs> so in this example, instead of this kind of a communication, if it was much faster, then you can commit much faster as well at the speed of the network. So this can primarily help to improve latency and perhaps to improve throughput as well. More interestingly, you know, your performance over here is now independent of, you know, conservative parameters that you may have to set in the optimistic case. So as an example, if you think about Ethereum, you're proposing a block every 12 seconds. And let's say everything related to a block, you know, in terms of dissemination and, and, and so on, happens within two seconds. Yet you have to wait until the 12 second boundary to make progress. But over here with the responsive protocol, you can move much faster. A second property that we have is, is linear communication. And linear communication is important because uh, we need to scale to tens of thousands of nodes, and each of them may have a, a low bandwidth. Well, you know, there is lesser communication, but you still <clears throat> need to, you know, maintain connections across these nodes. And a natural question is, you know, how do these nodes maintain these 10K connections? So I'm not sure if, if there are uh, example systems which have been built with tens of thousands of nodes using point-to-point -point, uh, connections, but perhaps you know that may or may not scale. So if you use a gossip layer or what we call peer-to-peer -peer or P2P, at that point you know you will be able to scale, but your latency will now depend on the latent on the diameter of the network, right? And this network co comprises of inferior, uh, relatively inferior nodes. So the way we address this is at the network layer where we plan to use uh, a content delivery uh, network or, or a CDN. So CDNs are, are widely used in the Web2 infrastructure to speed up. And at an abstract level, a CDN is, is a powerful hardware that can help scaling communication and computation. So for us, you know, in terms of communication, it will help in routing data to all nodes efficiently. And in terms of computation, the CDN can perform, you know, computationally heavy tasks for these nodes, you know, such as signature aggregation. So the use of a CDN synergizes with our optimistically responsive protocol. So CDNs will make things move things faster. And because our protocol is optimistically responsive, we will be able to move as fast as, as the CDN. If, if we did not have a responsive protocol, this would not have been possible. We would move things faster, but then you would have to incur a wait. 
and i will note that you know this is a cdn in some senses it's it's very much a centralizing entity so we cannot trust it so we use it only for efficiency and not security so you still need uh, you know some sort of, of of a gossip layer or so as a backup and the final thing that i'll mention with hotshot is that uh, we adapt hotshot to a, a proof of stake setting where the protocol runs in a sequence of epochs so in e each epoch there are a, a set of parties staked parties that are participating and and we assume that remains fixed during the duration of the epoch and they are responsible for committing some k blocks where k is a parameter as we move from one epoch to another we'll have to reconfigure uh, to the next epoch and for that the stake table or our data is is stored in in layer 1 so it's also stored in layer uh, in, in in our consensus but the source of truth comes from layer 1 so with these features let's try to see you know how we satisfy our desiderata in terms of security and efficiency so we said we want ethereum level security and the way we achieve this is by using an ethereum validator set and running an accountable protocol with respect to bribery resistance our protocol does not depend on a few nodes for security ever in terms of efficiency we get fast finality and, and good uh, throughput so we have our protocol has low latency and is optimistically responsive and the use of cdn helps with this fast finality as well and finally in terms of scaling to ethereum nodes of course the use of, of cdn helps a lot and uh, the, the fact that I mentioned, you know, right in the beginning, so separating data dissemination from consensus would, would help in the scaling too. So with that, let me move on to the third part of my talk, and, and that's about Tiramisu data availability. So recall that right at the beginning, we said consensus and data availability are the two requirements. And by data availability, the guarantee that you need is just to ensure availability of data to those who need it. So each of these nodes do not have, do not need to have access to all of the data themselves. So in terms of the amount of bandwidth needed to perform this computation, if it was broadcast, if there are n nodes and you know you had a block of size b, then bn communication was necessary. But in this setting, you can run a system where each party or each node over here just maintains a data share of size uh, order B over N. And but just by that, they can satisfy an external party whenever they need access to this data. So note that our nodes themselves do not need uh, this data because they are not executing. But they can satisfy anyone else, any, any external party, whenever they, they need this data. You know, this can be rollups or, or, or other services that are running. And this basic construction forms, you know, one of the layers of, of a tiramisu uh, data availability where we use verifiable information dispersal to send data shares of uh, size order b over n to every node and even if you know some linear number of faults happen we can still tolerate it because of which you know even this layer is resistant to any bribery attack but at the same time you know while we get the security Whenever a party needs to reconstruct, it needs to communicate with order n uh, nodes. And you know, if, if you're talking about n as being tens of thousands, this can be large and this can be slow. So you get security, but perhaps not as much efficiency. And then for that reason, we rely on two more layers. So our second layer, uh, so the two more optimistic layers, and, and, and our second layer over here is, is what we call Mascarpone, where we have a small data availability committee where each committee member, so think of uh, this committee as being randomly selected of some size kappa, and each committee member over here stores the entire data. So if you have a bribing adversary, you can actually corrupt this, but against a static adversary, this will give you a very high performance. And finally, we can just use the CDN itself uh, to, to provide you with, uh, with, with the data. So you'll get Web2 performance, but this is very much centralizing. 
So remember that data availability is, is additive. So having multiple layers is only helpful in the sense of, you know, you reach out to the CDN first, uh, get the data. If you cannot get it, you reach out to the second layer. If not, you always have uh, the last layer, which is resistant uh, to the bribing adversary. So between these layers, as you go up, you have better performance. And as you go down, you have better security. So let me summarize the talk with some of the key takeaways uh, over here. So we spoke about a shared decentralized sequencer, which provides interoperability across rollups. So you get finality on the order of transactions. And finally, you'll get censorship resistance and you, know, you can prevent monopolization. So we, we saw that a sequencer does not execute transactions and thus only needs consensus and a weaker form of uh, data broadcast, which we call data availability. <laughs> Second, we, we saw that Hotshot is, is a responsive, communication efficient consensus protocol adapted to a proof of stake setting. And at the networking layer, it uses a CDL. And finally, Tiramisu DA provides layers of data availability with varying degrees of efficiency and security. So with that, uh, I'd like to end my talk and leave you with what we think with, with a glimpse of what we think the future would be. <laughs>